Welcome to this complete masterclass where we're going to be breaking down the 14 things you need to know before you buy a camera for YouTube. I'm also going to be talking about the best cameras for YouTube in 2024, and we're going to be going through how to save money and some of the biggest mistakes people make when purchasing a camera. They end up with features that they don't like, they end up overspending, and so stick around until the end because we're going deep in this masterclass. But right up top, let's just talk about the four big categories to consider when searching for the perfect camera. And so it's really an intersection of, of course, first of all, what's your budget? How much can you afford? Then what features do you need? Just basic YouTube video features or filmmaking features? And then size, are you gonna be traveling? Are you gonna be just using it at a home office? or at your house and never moving it, then size and weight really comes into play. And then finally, complexity. Nobody really talks about this one. Complexity can slow you down. So what is your skill level? Is it beginner friendly or are you a little bit more advanced? And so at the intersection of those four things is where we're really gonna be talking about how to choose the best camera for YouTube. And if you're grateful for deep dive education videos like this, hit the like button as we dive into the 14 things you need to know so you don't buy the wrong camera. And you know, I get it. Cameras can be confusing. It's overwhelming when you see how many are out there. These days, we're confused at Think Media with Sony and Canon and all these new brands launching so many different models. So we really recommend, first of all, to start with what you have. This is actually a throwback picture of my wife, Sonia, and I in 2003. And it's funny, we're playing with cameras. You know, and since that time, myself and the Think Media team have actually hands-on reviewed and tested hundreds of cameras. And over the years, we've seen technology change, gear change, and you want to start with what you have, but I've learned then level up as you go, especially with the money-making opportunity that exists on YouTube and content creation. Consider these things tools that can generate cash for you, maybe freelance video, maybe content creation directly. And let me ask you a question. Are you planning on buying a camera soon? And out of all your research so far, which model are you thinking about investing in? All right, let's get into these 14 features. Here's number one is sensor size, sensor size. If you wonder how do they price cameras? Why do cameras cost different amounts of money and what exactly is different about cameras? Well, one of the foundational things, number one is the sensor size. This is the very piece of technology that is capturing the image. The size of the sensor is gonna affect image quality. It's gonna affect what's called depth of field. Do you want that blurry background behind you? That's what depth of field is. Do you want it to kind of look cool and uh, have that YouTube look, that filmmaking look? Well, sensor size is gonna come into play when creating that cool blurry background effect. How about low light? performance. If you always have great light or you're shooting in the daylight or you're kind of an outdoor channel, um, if you're creating content, then maybe that doesn't matter as much to you. But if it's going to be a low light situation, the bigger the sensor, the better. But also, the bigger the sensor, the more expensive. Now, buckle your seatbelt for this image because it's a little overwhelming. But I want to point you to the most common sensors that we typically see. This one, uh, the red arrow pointing to one inch is a very desirable sensor. I should note that, think about your smartphone on the far right side of the screen, it's gonna have a small sensor. No matter how crazy Droid or Apple gets, like the sensor just can't really be that large in most smartphones. So really when you step into one inch, there's a lot of people, the new DJI Pocket 3, people are like, oh my gosh, it has a one inch sensor. Pretty good. Now, if we go over to the left and we go to APS-C, that is probably the most common mid-range sensor size. A lot of the most popular Sony and Canon cameras have an APS-C sensor. That's what people were talking about when they mentioned that term. And then full frame, very trendy, very desirable is probably where the kind of high-end, more expensive cameras are going to land. There's a few others on here. Micro Four Thirds is, you got some Panasonic cameras that'll do that, and medium format's kind of more of a photography thing. Full frame, that is desired by 
photographers, wedding photographers, and then filmmakers. And people debate this all day long. Here's let's simplify sensor size equals image quality, depth of field, and low light performance. It's one factor to consider when you're having your list of the 14 things we're going to talk about. Okay, what sensor size am I looking for? Number two, video resolution. The question is, what resolution can this camera capture video in? You know, it's kind of funny because full HD used to seem amazing when we started to get HD content. H you watch a movie in HD, like, oh my goodness. And you can see 1920 by 1080 there in the middle of the screen. That's 1080p. 720, you know, that's, oh, it's 720p. And what's really hilarious to me is I grew up watching, you know, DVDs or VHS tapes that were standard definition. And when you actually compare that in perspective to 4K, you look at this tiny little SD standard definition box in the corner and how many of those you could fit inside of an ultra HD 4K image, right? Um, and so when you start thinking the most kind of baseline for content is going to be HD, but 4K is in a 2024 world, basically kind of the standard where we're at now. It, it seems to be everywhere. You can get away with HD. And so I would argue that full HD 1080p is the minimum. But 4K now is so mainstream in TVs, so mainstream in phones. Um, 4K requires a better computer to edit, though. So if you plan on editing 4K footage in a separate camera, you want to consider the entire workflow. Like, okay, when I capture this footage, now, if you have, let's say, one of the latest Samsung or iPhones, you also know you can edit right on those devices. And so they capture 4K, they can edit 4K. But there's different things you want to consider. And then shooting in a large resolution will allow you to also crop in when editing. And so here's an example. If you are capturing this image of my family in 4K, but you edited the video in full HD, you could crop in on our dog Sophie there and you could see that without like her getting blurry, without her losing that crispy look, sometimes people will shoot in 4K and then it allows a lot more flexibility when editing. And so ultimately, I would think you should ask a couple questions for cameras that shoot 4K as well. Because one of the biggest mistakes is if you go down to a Best Buy or a camera shop, chances are you might run into somebody who are going to throw some terms at you. Oh, it's got this. It's got that. But if you don't ask the right questions, you can end up maybe getting the wrong camera. And so here's a few questions to consider. One is, is there a recording limit when shooting 4K versus 1080p? A lot of cameras will actually be only able, uh, only able to shoot a burst of 4K, like maybe five minutes or 10 minutes, maybe they can film an hour of 1080p. And so as files get larger, sometimes there's a recording limit. Now, if there isn't, that's why you start going, oh wow, that camera can shoot 4K unlimited, uncompressed raw, like there's different language that happens, but just a good question to ask. Like if I shoot 4K, manufacturers will put that on the box and you're like, well, it's a three minute clip. Like, I mean, that's, that's kind of cool, but I actually was hoping it could, you know, record longer than that. Is there an image crop? If you hear someone say it shoots uncropped 4K, then that's a really good thing. Um, the Canon M50 back in the day, which is a little bit outdated now in a 2024 world, was like, we have 4K. And then you switch it to 4K mode and all of a sudden the camera would just zoom in like crazy. And you're like, oh, I don't quite have the same shot because it crops in. And I'm just doing that with the lens in this particular example on screen here. But is there an image crop? Now, next is does the camera overheat when shooting 4K? I think the big light bulb moment that we want to discover together here is, is that the larger the file size, the larger the resolution, if you're recording a video clip and you know there's it's bigger resolution, maybe there's more data there, it's just putting more wear and tear on the camera, more and and more wear and tear on editing. And so all of that is solvable, but am I going to run into problems with the camera overheating in 4K mode? 
it's also a way to get around issues where maybe your camera is capable of shooting 4K, it overheats in 4K, but you actually don't even need it. Well, you just shoot in 1080p, problem solved. So different things you should consider as we go to number three, which is lens aperture. So we ask, okay, what is the sensor size? What is the video resolution capabilities? Can it shoot full HD, 1080p? Can it shoot 4K? And then what is the lens aperture? Whether or not you are actually having an interchangeable lens camera, um, you would ask, okay, even if the this ZV-1 camera here, the lens is built in, I can't change the lens of this camera, but what is the starting aperture? What is the aperture range? And what's that gonna affect? Well, let's look. And so if we look at lens aperture, this is also going to influence low light performance. It's also gonna influence the depth of field, that blurry background look. The lower number is actually better and more desirable. And the lower the number gets, the more money the lens will cost or the camera. So we're looking at the new er, Canon R50 and the details on the lens are kind of black on black. So it's hard to read and see, but what we're looking at is the kit lens, the lens that's included if you choose to buy it with the kit lens. And this is a 4.5 to 6.3 aperture lens. That means it, it, it at its lowest point, if you're zoomed all the way out, the lowest it'll go is 4.5. If you zoom all the way in, it's a zoom lens, the lowest it will go is 6.3 at the most zoomed in range of the lens. Now that's not very good. A lot of times what you'll learn is that the kit lenses that are included in the camera kit, if you go to Costco, if you go to Walmart or you go somewhere, the kit lens can sometimes be sufficient, but they're usually not the best. And it's because they're part of a package and they're a little bit more affordable. And so ultimately, if we look at the uh, aperture, this is how we can decide, okay, what is the value and the cost here? Now, maybe there's a point and shoot camera. We just mentioned the Sony ZV-1, which is pictured on the right. That camera starts at 1.8. That's amazing. Typically, 1.4 or 1.2 is the best you're going to get. And usually at a 1.2, you call that a Canon L glass lens. It's going to be thousands of dollars for the lens, usually the lower the number gets. So when you start thinking about 1.8, wow, that's really great. On the Canon G7X, that also starts at 1.8. Now, I looked up here. Uh, this is now a pretty old Sony point and shoot camera used this camera runs for 234 dollars but if you didn't watch a video like this then you might be like oh this is a great deal seems the same as everything else but then you realize okay well it's starting aperture is 3.2 versus 1.8 and then notice the prices on the screen this is kind of just a rough comparison of you know a used sony uh, W800 is only $234. Why is this other one a cup, you know, a lot more? Well, it's going to be all the different features we're talking about in this video. And again, aperture is one of those. And so when you also think about the aperture, here's some questions. What is the starting aperture of your lens? Can you upgrade your lenses later? One of the cool things as we go through this entire video together is you might buy a camera body, the the separate from the lens, and maybe you just get the kit lens off of Amazon. And by the way, um, toward, at the end of the video, I'm gonna go through the top camera picks this year, best cameras for YouTube, that we've done our deep dive research and debates at Think Media. And perhaps you do buy the kit lens up first, you know, first, but then later you can upgrade. One of probably the most important things to be thinking about when you're thinking about what camera to buy is maybe not just what can I afford and purchase today, but how could I continue to upgrade? And if it's a fixed lens camera, you cannot. And so can I upgrade the lenses later? And then it's the aperture plus the sensor, which is really gonna equal amazing low light performance. So I know that when I was in my wedding videography days, I would have a full frame DSLR camera at the time, plus Canon L glass 50 millimeter 1.2. And I could go to candlelit dinners 
no other lighting like in a barn you got the kind of moody hipster lights hanging rope lights candles and the average camera would just look terrible in that environment but if you combine a great sensor a full frame sensor with a really fast is what they would call it lens with a low aperture then you can have incredible low light performance so can you invest in a good camera body now and then upgrade your lenses later? As we go into number four, the next question we got to ask is, does this camera have autofocus and does it have autofocus during video? Now, I should clarify that this particular 14 tips we're going through and the best cameras for YouTube we have YouTube content creators in mind here on this channel, Think Media. If you're new here, definitely subscribe. And so there's a lot of different intents. One being, if you're only ever gonna be behind the camera and you don't plan on needing a selfie screen or needing it to be easy to use and easy to have the video look great, if you're filming by yourself, then some of these features might be a little bit less relevant. But what we need as YouTube content creators is man, we want to have good autofocus without us having to manually adjust things. We want autofocus that we can depend on when we're shooting and recording by ourselves. So you does it have face tracking? Can it easily track your face? Does it have fast autofocus? That might be a little double entendre there. Fast AF, you know, that's what we're looking for. Like that's how it's what I want to be. Um, does it hunt? Or rather, the question is, does it hunt like sometimes you'll see focus where the person's in focus and then the back wall is in focus and the person's in focus again and then the back wall's in focus this sony camera i'm using you might notice that like you can see how quickly it can focus on my hand or focus on a on a, my face here and then if we come up here how quickly it can grab focus on this particular device it's a good autofocus and so depending on what kind of content you want to be creating then that is you want the camera not to hunt and constantly be going in and out of focus. Is it dependable? Now, the technical terms here in this masterclass where we're learning a lot and you might want to watch it one or two times to learn all the terms is, hey, is the autofocus on this camera contrast based or is it phase detection? What we want is phase detection autofocus. So one of the popular vlogging cameras back in the day is this Canon G7X. It had pretty good autofocus, but because it was contrast based, it was nothing even close to what we're looking at here with these Sony cameras that could just grab focus quickly and then you know go back and forth. And, and even as you're talking, you're just talking to the camera, vlogging, walking around, it's just the, the focus is going all over the place. That's typically contrast based where phase detection in a 2024 world, basically every new Sony or Canon camera has phase detection and they've been the leaders of autofocus. And then Panasonic, Fuji, Nikon, a lot of times, even some of their newer cameras have not been updated with phase detection. Now, to be fair, almost everybody is, is upgrading now, every camera brand. You know, one example is the Nikon Z30. And this camera did not make it into our list that I'll get into in a few minutes when we talk about the best cameras. But this is actually a really, really good camera. It was in our list last year of the best cameras for YouTube because you could change the lenses. You had the selfie screen and it had hybrid autofocus. It was actually a combination of phase detection and contrast based. So bottom line does it have great autofocus? Can you depend on the autofocus? Is the autofocus something that's gonna make it easy for you when it's stressful enough trying to shoot YouTube videos and then you look at the footage later and you're like, oh my goodness, like the focus wasn't dependable. It wasn't easy to use. I just wanna set it, forget it, and focus on creating the content. Which brings us to number five, which is audio. How do you wanna record audio? Does the camera have the features you want to make recording audio easy? The big desire for YouTube content creators is a mic input. Does the camera have a mic input to use an external microphone? Now, there's ways around this, but that would be the huge desire. Now, does it also have a headphone output? This is still pretty rare. And even if a camera does have a headphone output, not this is maybe not going to be used again if I'm behind the camera 
and I'm filming somebody else and I'm monitoring, I might have headphones on continuously and filming, you know, doing everything, but I'm behind the camera for the YouTube creator that you put it on a tripod. You could test the audio. You could just do a soundtrack. You know, you could get away with not having a headphone input, but remember, these are all the different things that can in, be a part of how much a camera costs and what exactly you're investing in. If you were planning to use it as a filmmaker, cinematography being behind the camera, then maybe a headphone output is a non-negotiable. And then you could ask, does the camera have a good on-camera microphone? Because maybe you do, don't want to use an external microphone. One of our favorites, the Sony ZV-E1, which the version one did make our list this year. It's an amazing camera. It's the one I'm holding right here. This camera has a really great on-camera microphone. You can see on the right side of the screen, it actually comes included with a little windscreen, which makes it great for vlogging. If you're vlogging in a windy outdoor environment, instead of just getting this like kind of stuff that's happening, it actually filters. It's a detachable windscreen. And it, this camera also has a microphone input. And so if you can actually look at this very example, I'm able to also put a shotgun microphone right on top of this camera and use the microphone input. But if I forgot that at home or just wanted to keep the setup even more lean, then you have a lot of features packed right into the camera. Now there's a Mark II version of this and we'll circle back to this um, camera a little bit later and talk about the pros and cons of each. This one's coming in around this time, around $900. The version one's about $250 cheaper. Um, and the, the new version has a wider lens, additional autofocus features, and then Sony claims a better on-camera microphone. But again, we're not gonna get into exact cameras yet. We'll, we'll circle back. But here's a tip in case you're like, Sean, I'm super frustrated because my camera doesn't have a mic input or you know, I actually got a camera for uh, as a gift for the holidays and it doesn't have a mic input. Sometimes if somebody that's shopping for you or you're shopping for your own camera and you didn't think to ask this question, you maybe went down what what like Canon would have as a photography line. Like there was the, the DSLRs, there was the like T7i. Well, the I meant it's more for video. The T7i had the mic input. The T7, a lot of similar features, did not have the mic input. But if you're, oh man, I don't have a mic input. There's no way I could create great content. It's not true. You totally can because there's a solution for every problem. For example, we were filming this video um, uh, a few years ago and I had an older action camera and I wanted to have really great audio, but not only did the action camera not have a mic input, I still wasn't even gonna be very close to the camera itself. And so what I did was I bought a $12 lavalier mic, plugged it into my iPhone with the dongle, turned on the audio recorder and put the iPhone in my pocket. And then I recorded the audio separately, the audio file, which the lavalier mic was connected to my shirt. And then in editing, synced, synchronized the audio and the video. So there's a way around it, but you also might be saying, that's not, I don't want to do that. Like, that sounds awful. And go exactly. That's why by, we're, we're building up with these 14 things to try to get all the features we need so we can also have a workflow that's as fast as possible and as stress free as possible. But if you need to solve the problem, it is solvable. There's external recorders, kind of like this Zoom F2 here. There's a newer version now that also goes Bluetooth where you could actually record the audio separate and sync it with any camera later in editing. But if it's me, I do want to avoid this. This I would prefer not to do this and prefer to make things as simple as possible. Number six, size, weight, and build quality. So Chase Jarvis says this, famous photographer, videographer, says the best camera is the one that you actually have with you. I've been shooting for a long time. I've loved taking cameras with me when I first married my wife, Sonia. Um, we've been married for 18 years. Now we have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, but so for 15 years, we didn't have kids. And so one of the things I've learned was when it was just the two of us, we'd go on a vacation and I would love to bring some lenses with me, bring a camera body with me. I enjoyed taking photography. Now I've realized carrying my lenses and my camera is actually a little bit more difficult because now I'm carrying a one-year-old. And so it's like different things, different seasons of life. Maybe you can relate. 
So what I realized was it's, it's one thing to have a really great camera. It's a whole nother thing to actually practically take it with you or make it easy to travel with. And this is why smartphones or smaller cameras can become really practical. And so I love this quote because uh, not enough people are thinking about, am I actually going to use this in the most practical situations that I face in my life? What is the size of the camera? How much does the camera weigh? What is the build quality? Am I going to be needing this camera to perform in snow, in rain, and or am I just going to keep it in my heated home and it's never going to have any dust or issues that uh, that affect the camera? So what are you going to use it for? What is it? I'll ask you that. What 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 do you want to actually use this camera for? And not like you're imagining, well, perhaps someday I need a camera because I may go on an African safari. I could be by myself on foot for the entire trip. I, I could find myself in it. Well, okay, yeah, maybe you could find yourself in that situation. But like practically, what do you need this next camera um, to be used for that you're thinking about investing in? Do you have a budget for multiple cameras? And don't forget your smartphone. So in some cases, maybe some footage is going to be recorded in one environment. This is why real high level content creators or maybe storytellers invest in a drone and invest in an action camera like a GoPro and invest in their basic mirrorless camera and then also use their smartphone like you they all have a use case and mirrorless cameras which would kind of be the main camera I think there's not even DSLRs on our list anymore mirrorless cameras can kind of be the best of both worlds all that means is that the form factor, the way that the camera works is a little bit different. And mirrorless is kind of the newest. I'm not saying DSLRs are irrelevant, but mirrorless cameras are basically what you're seeing right now. And here's kind of an example of two different cameras when it comes to size, weight, and build quality. We're looking at the Canon R50, which is plastic. It's not weatherproof. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying if you if this was the camera you took on the African safari on foot that you went for eight weeks and 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 dust storms and you ran into Indiana Jones and some different things, I don't know if this camera would hold up as good as a camera that's weatherproof, built for rugged rugged use, like the Lumix GX5. And so couple things to consider. Most of us, as your everyday YouTube creators, don't need a very rugged weatherproof camera, but it's a good question to ask. Number seven, and maybe one of the most important factors for practical YouTube shooting is the selfie screen. Number seven is, does it have a selfie screen? And it is the selfie screen touch screen. And so this is, of course, ideal for YouTube content and vlogging because and when you think about YouTube content, it's kind of like first person um, filmmaking like your or solo filmmaking and you're also the subject you're you're the videographer and you're the subject right so how do you monitor yourself is this is ideal for youtube content for vlogging and then touchscreen makes it makes things fast and easy like can you reach up and just tap the screen to say you know focus on my face and that's what most new cameras have the ability to do or Maybe you actually don't want your face in focus. You want the background to focus. You tap the screen and it focuses behind you. And so a cool feature is having touch screen for AF autofocus during video. Canon has really kind of been a leader here. And actually, while Sony cameras sort of have an edge in a lot of areas, they've been late to the game with touch screen features in a lot of cases. And so when, again, you think through this, you purchase a camera at a local camera store, and then you're like, oh man, this is a little harder to use than I thought because you didn't have all the questions that we're going through. Number eight, record time limit. 99% of creators I talk to have ran into this screen sometime in their journey and they were shocked because they're like, why in the world did the movie stop recording? Like, why did the video stop recording? Why does it have a limit? I was trying to film a video. A lot of times I'll shoot down to film a YouTube video, right? Especially over the years before I knew about this. And I once I edit the video down, it's gonna be about a 20 minute video. But to get through my little outline and talk about everything, um, it took me 44 minutes to film, right? So you hit record, 
you run, you sit in your chair, you like pull out your notes and you start talking. And then uh, I would run back behind the camera, especially if I can't see the selfie screen. I had no way to determining, no way to determine if it was still recording. Get behind the camera, look at it. Why is, why is it not recording anymore? When did it stop? And I lost the last 12 minutes, the last 15 minutes, because I'm filming myself and the video stopped. How frustrating. And so does this camera have a record limit? So many DSLRs and mirrorless cameras actually have a 30 minute record limit. This in and of itself is basically this whole thing you can research because in Europe, there was a five to 12% tax on cameras that were intended for video. So what once camera companies started to include video recording inside of essentially photography cameras, if the camera only recorded for 29 minutes and 59 seconds, they did not have to pay that tax. What's funny is it's then kind of like just something that stuck with a lot of cameras um, and took a little while to kind of be upgraded across camera models. In a 2024 world, this has been mostly remedied, but there's a whole website you can look up and there is still some, Can Canon is famous for crippling their lower end cameras and still including a 30 minute limit, things like that. In fact, the Canon R50, which is the new M50 with their new lens mount and mirrorless, both were I suppose, but all that to say is that camera has a one hour record limit. So it's more than 30, but it's also one hour. So if you thought, well, I also wanna use this camera to record uh, a, a, a talk um, at my church. And sometimes the pastor talks for uh, over an hour. Well, it would be really frustrating if at you know an hour, and he usually goes an hour 10, an hour 15, boom, the camera stops recording. So again, very important question when doing your research, maybe looking at a spec sheet, researching videos on YouTube. But do you actually need to record clips longer than 30 minutes? If the answer is no, and you are very clear on your intent for what you're going to use this camera for, then, hey, no big deal. You can pick up an older model. You could get around that. You're going to be using smaller clips. Now, if you want to film longer, it's nice in a lot of cases to have what's called a continuous power or a, a dummy battery that gives you continuous power or USB-C in some of the most recent cameras like the A6700. You don't even need a dummy battery. USB-C can not only transfer data, but it can also transfer power to the camera and there's no record limit. So you start seeing, wow, okay, what are the implications? Because it's also, your, your record limit's also gonna be predicated by the SD card size, like how much actual storage do you have? And is the battery gonna die? And you obviously can't swap the battery real time. So some different things to consider. You know, one thing to mention is probably the most untalked about type of camera for 99% of YouTube creators that is not irrelevant is camcorders. Um, and camcorders, while the reason they're probably ignored by a lot of tech reviewers for YouTube content is typically the image can't come close to an APS-C or full frame mirrorless camera with the lens choices and all of that. Camcorders solve an incredible amount of problems if you want simplicity, including no cam, uh, uh, no record limit, including headphone jacks, microphone jacks, selfie screens, and the ability to just plug the camera into the wall. However, people are still, myself included, usually av avoid camcorders because you want a certain look. And there are some newer camcorders that aren't very uh, expensive, that are one inch sensors and some different things. And if you really just want simplicity on a budget, under $300, you can get some incredible camcorders. Now this, is, this video is a little bit outdated, but I do have a video kind of explaining the pros and cons and differences and you could check that out as well as everything else in the show notes of this video um, on as you're watching it. Number nine, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and or, and or NFC. And so this would just be the connectivity features. Do you want or need to transfer content to your phone for social media? If you're getting a separate camera for content creation, perhaps photos and videos. You wanna film phone th thumbnails, photos for Instagram, photos for the YouTube community tab. You wanna record video clips. 
Do you plan or intend to transfer content to your phone? Do you also want to use your phone as a remote control for your camera? You'd be surprised. If you already have a camera, a lot of times your smartphone is an incredible tool to tap into your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or NFC features. And to use your smartphone as a way to control your phone, even at a distance. In fact, if your camera does not have a selfie screen, you can actually use your camera to frame up your shot. There's sometimes you can't flip the screen around, but it does have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and it gives you an ability to monitor the shot and step away and be like, okay, and then go. And so one thing to tap into is those features on your camera. Now, most newer cameras do have Wi-Fi, smartphone connectivity. It opens up the question of how reliable is it? How easy is it to use? Um, there's even the ability, footnote, to do a laptop in some cases, to actually plug into the USB input of, say, certain camera, Canon cameras. Maybe you get a 10-foot, 15-foot USB cable, plug it into your laptop, and use your laptop as a way to monitor, adjust camera settings. So some things to consider as well. Number 10, skill level. Skill level. More features does not necessarily mean better. In fact, we've learned that for a lot of people we help at Think Media, that sometimes more features are worse, that it would be better to have a simple camera that's easy to use, that has a great looking shot, because the more features you have, the more chance you also have to kind of mess up the image. You're like, why do I look like an Oompa Loompa? Your white balance was off. You didn't know how to really adjust it. It's like, you know, why this camera, everybody else's footage on this camera looks amazing. Why does mine look so bad? Well, knowing how to use your camera is going to be a big deal, and that's going to come into the skill level. One of the things that in a 2024 world we've discovered is that Canon continues to kind of target the everyday user. And you can see on screen this kind of look, look at this user friendly mode they have inside of their cameras, um, the newer ones, where it's like, do you want blurry? Slide bar to the left. Want sharp? Slide it to the right. Like just, they're they're trying to kind of oversimplify things. And there's in-camera features. The new R50 takes this kind of to another level by trying to make things a lot more user friendly for you. And so, for example, I just mentioned this. This is the Canon R50, and it was their latest attempt to make a small mirrorless camera. I think this is the quote unquote smallest and lightest camera. So it's kind of a good example. On screen, doesn't really do it justice. This is not very large, but it does have interchangeable lenses. Smaller than it appears on screen, I would say, right? And um, it's almost, it's nearly as small and it's slightly lighter than the original and very popular M50. But here's who they were targeting with this camera enthusiasts and beginners. A lot of camera snobs or camera people who are like, oh, I want more features, I want this, I want that. Great. You know what you want. You know the features you want, the ease of use you want. Um, and so this is why skill level is such an important question to bring up. Again, getting all stuck in the details and complexity of the camera is not helpful if you don't end up creating the content you need to create and actually uploading the videos on YouTube, which brings us to image stabilization. Number 11, image stabilization. So on screen here, we're looking at a camera lens. There's a little on and off switch that says AF or MF. That's going to be autofocus or manual focus. It just allows you to turn off in case you want to manually adjust the camera. And then it has a stabilizer. Do you want that on or off? This particular lens has a motor inside of it. There's actually technology inside of the lens that is adding stabilization so that your photos could be extra crispy um, and not blurry. And also this will remove shake from videos. And so there's three types of image stabilization that you need to know about. The first is optical lens image stabilization. This is a great one. This means that inside of the lens, there is motors that are stabilizing, giving you less shake and helping you um, with stabilization. There's also electronic image stabilization. This is a little bit different. This is digital. And it at in, in the past, could lead to some funny results. Sometimes it kind of warps the image. It could maybe make things a little bit warpy. Also, 
back to the idea of cropping uh, your camera and it cropping in a little bit, the way that electronic works is it needs something to work with. So if this was the full shot, a lot of times you'll turn on electronic uh, stabilization low and you'll see the shot goes in a little bit. Why? Because it wants to use the edges. It's using what's not seen on screen to sort of stabilize the shot if you're walking around vlogging. Then you turn it on to medium and it goes on even more. That means there's more video footage not on screen cropped in so that if you're walking around, the electronic Im image stabilization makes things look smooth in the middle. And then you go on to high and it's like, <laughs> bro, I get better. But it, it, it's like different levels of electronic image stabilization. And then you have the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, which is called IBIS, in body image stabilization. This is technology, actual motors inside of the camera that are stabilizing and moving the sensor at three different or accesses that can stabilize. The, now, now, as we talk about it, remember, let's go back and, and talk about size, weight, build quality. If you're gonna have IBIS, it makes the camera a little bit larger. It makes the camera a little bit heavier. Now, technology is amazing and it's always changing. And so there's always a cost, not just financially, but to the implication of these different features. And so there's also, maybe you've seen GoPro footage or um, like the Osmo action camera. They call their stabilization rock steady, DJI does. GoPro calls it hyper smooth. And if you're out snowboarding, I've done many GoPro and D Osmo tests. It's it's oftentimes amazing, but the, re the way it works is there's kind of a very wide shot, at least what's being captured by the camera. And there's so much, and, and then it's cropped as far as what you're seeing. And there's so much border that you're, that is unseen. It allows it to be hyper smooth. And there's and then there's the technology they use to blend it all. You're probably already overwhelmed like me with the amount of information we're covering. But that's why this is a masterclass. And so let's kind of break down some practical things here. What cameras start to do is they combine different image stabilization features. You can see right here on this G7X point and shoot camera. It says IS at the end of all the Canon zoom lens 4.2X IS. What does that mean? Image stabilization. That means that there's optical image stabilization included on the lens. And then you go into your menu and there's also electronic IS. So as you begin to learn your camera, depending on its features, a combination of both can be very helpful to get maybe the shot that you want. You know, one of the things that I will do when I take a camera out of the box and I'm getting it all set up in a, in a situation right here where I do not need image stabilization. I'm sitting in an office, the camera's mounted to the desk. I turn off all the image stabilization. And sometimes I'm like, man, the shot doesn't look quite right. It's because electronic image stabilization is on and the camera's cropped in. It also usually has a reduction of image quality when you do that. So to get the widest, purest, crispiest shot, you know, I would turn off those features, but knowing if I then take the camera off the tripod, head out with my wife and kids, and I wanna film on a beach on vacation, and I'm gonna be moving around, I'm like, okay, let me get this thing set up, and I'm gonna turn on maybe the image stabilization to help me. On Sony, they call it Steady Shot Optical IS. So what you'll discover if you buy third-party lenses like Tamron, they've got another name for it, Sigma's got another name for it, so even trying to figure out all the different image stabilizations is kind of a category in and of itself. And here's an example of what IBIS could look like. You have the three different ways that it's gonna stabilize the shot because you know some of you might be out here, you're filming, you hand, the fam you hand your camera to a family member to film at the holidays and you know, your uncle's been drinking too much. And so he needs, he needs all the image stabilization that he can, you know, and he's doing this and he's going this way. And you're like, bro, like there's also, you, as a user, you need to stabilize a little bit with the way you film, but IBIS could help. So you could see kind of, this would all be how the motors are reacting. In a way, it's kind of like having a gimbal inside of your camera is essentially the idea here. And so a couple examples is the Sony a6700 has, IBIS, the R5 and R6 Mark II have in-body image stabilization. The Panasonic GH5 has it. And here's what's crazy if your camera has IBIS. You actually might have all three. The lens 
could have image stabilization. The camera body has in-body image stabilization and there's electronic image stabilization. And so hit like hit the like button if you're stressed because of how many different features you're learning. But again, there's an answer to every problem. Let's say you don't have any of the things I just described. Well, if you ever see somebody using a gimbal, even if the camera's heavy, that what in this picture here, where I'm holding this camera, I think it's like a Canon SL2 or something. It doesn't have very good stabilization, but you could get a cinematic shot if you add technology like a handheld gimbal. But let me ask you a question. Why would you want to do that? If you, again, are filmmaking or traveling and you have space in your bag to do so, that's great. But I also like to think, okay, the best camera you have is the camera you actually have with you. How can I have the best features possible inside of the camera if pop, you know, so that I can keep things as simple and clean? Because if you bring a bunch of extra tech and extra ac accessories, I'm into all of the above, but it makes things more complex, takes longer to set up. You're like, hey, family, hey, kids, uh, don't have fun yet. Let me like get my camera ready and like put the lens on and then let me get my gimbal and let me balance my gimbal and then I'll be, okay, all right, son, go run, do what you're, like it's too late. So you sometimes think, I learned that back in the wedding days. Like, oh, oh could you redo the kiss? Oh, sorry, I wasn't ready. I need to actually restabilize my gimbal. Just different things. How quickly can you get your camera ready and in shooting mode, depending on what you're using it for? Number 12. Frame rate and slow motion, frame rate and slow motion. All right, we talked earlier about um, does it shoot 4K? Will it overheat in 4K? You know, these different things as far as video resolution. But now on top of that, when you get into video resolution and we look on screen here, we can see, okay, this camera shoots 1080p in 30 frames a second. That's what 30p means. This camera also has the option to shoot 1080p, 1920 by 1080, in 120p. That would be used for slow motion. Oh, cool. Okay, so it could still do that. And this camera shoots in 4K resolution only at 30p. Pretty typical and rare, I would say. So once you get into it, you know, someone might be like, this camera shoots 4K. You know, it's on the box. But it shoots 4K for three minute clips at only 24 or 25 frames per second. And that's not even what you want your final footage to be in. Essentially, that might be unusable for you. You're like, ah, they kind of marketed it that way, but the camera overheats. It doesn't have the frame rate I need. And so it's sort of so knowing not just what frame rates exist, but what frame rates um, can film at different resolutions is a good question to ask. And so on screen, we're looking at how people typically use frame rates. So 24 frames per second is a big desire and it doesn't really go lower than that. And so if you want that film look, 24 is great. We'll debate this kind of stuff at Think Media. You have the, the film look is sort of that, you know, it's the most cool, the most hipster look. Now, 30 frames per second, I would call standard. And one of the side quests we could go on here is realizing that you can't really go up. So if you film in 30 frames per second and then use it in a project that is 24, it's going to eventually be a, a documentary or a kind of cinematic look or a film look. You can go down pretty easy. Going up, there's software, there's different things, but you, you can't really go up. So one of the reasons why I personally like to shoot in 30 is I feel like it's the most universal, like if someday we want to use the footage. Now, if eventually, if we make like a Think Media documentary, if the final product is in 24P, then we're good. Uh, but if the final product was in 30 and we had a whole bunch of footage that was lower than that, it, it could just be frustrating. Now, 60 frames per second, sometimes that's gaming and you could also use it for slow motion. Webcams will boast. It does 60 frames per second because you also want to maybe match the frame rate of your game. And you've got, you know, like uh, that you want the motion, you want all the action to look really cool. And then 120 or even higher is what people will use for super slow motion. And even some of the newest and best cameras will maybe shoot 120 frames a second, but with no audio, with a max clip length of one minute or three minutes. 
which is also totally fine because if you are shooting super high, super slow motion, you don't need to film an hour long seminar. The purpose of it is you just want to film the person doing the flip. You want to film the lion running through the Sahara. So, you know, just thinking about what is the frame rate? Do I need or want to shoot slow motion? And here's a power tip for some aspiring filmmakers, which is not even on our list of 14 things. You could ask the question, does this camera have any log format recording? Does this camera also, in addition to slow motion, can I shoot in what Sony will have things like S-Log2 or S-Log3? And this is where this is going to help the footage usually look terrible when you're recording it. Wow, it looks flat and the colors are so bad and, and it, it actually looks worse. Well, the filmmaker knows I'm getting the most dynamic range when I use log. I'm getting the, the, the flattest image possible. And I'm going to pull that inside of my video editor, do some color correction, and then add a, a, a LUT to that, add some things to it. And all of a sudden, boom, it just comes alive. And so for ease of use, personal opinion for this simple everyday YouTube video, I don't want to record in a log format. I actually want the footage to be as ready as possible, even instantly ready. But if someday you intend or desire to do, let's say more filmmaking or really have a vibe to your film, um, to your YouTube videos, then something to consider. Number 13, does this camera have a clean HDMI input for or an output for live streaming? And so if you want, this is exactly what I'm doing in this training right here is I've got a Sony camera mounted to my desk with an HDMI cable plugged into it. And clean means you don't see a little battery uh, thing up here, little brackets, you know, 120 minutes left or all this other stuff. So clean would mean, wait, I don't want to see the menus on the screen when I'm when I'm live streaming like I'm doing right here. So so when someone goes, ah, oh, it doesn't have a clean HDMI output, that's what they're talking about. And you could use a device like a cam link, Elgato cam link, where it goes HDMI from your camera into the cam link, into the USB port on your camera, and boom, you have turned a fancy camera into a webcam. And by the way, I'll link up in the description if you want to see a complete desk tour of how I'm switching cameras, of the cameras I'm using and the technology then I'll link that down into the show notes and resources. Um, and this is a pretty fancy setup. I'm changing angles and all this different stuff. But I got to ask when I'm picking out cameras for a setup like this, does it have a clean HDMI for live streaming? And it's also a good question to ask is, does your camera have a HDMI output period? What is the size of that? Because when you're, is it full size? That's pretty rare. Is it a micro HDMI? So figuring all of that out. And if you look here to my right, I've actually swapped the camera since then, but right here was a ZV-1. And I'll put it back on screen. Um, this is what you could use that camera. One of the reasons why the ZV-1 is in our list is because it kind of does everything. You could use it for a webcam streaming like this. You could use it for vlogging. You could use it for talking head YouTube videos. It's also all in one. You don't have to change the lens. It starts at one point in aperture. So now you start realizing when we take very seriously the advice that we give on this channel, this is how many different distinctions and things we think about when recommending a camera as the best camera for YouTube. And so one of the cool things about this is, again, I'm mounted on the desk and plugged into it is two things, the HDMI cable and a USB cable, which is actually all you need in order to keep this camera alive and powered for live streaming. Now, you also could do the external dumb, dummy battery. And the truth is, when you use the USB cable, it eventually dies. But I never live stream for 14 hours, so it's usually not a problem. So long as you have it plugged in, it's like slowly goes down. And so it's usually good enough. And so you can see here, uh, that's, you know, HDMI and that right there is the USB, which I'm using for power. You know, this is the, still to my left here, this camera, it's like a Sony a6400 or I believe, and underneath it right there is a cable plugged into a power outlet. That's the dummy battery. And then 
I have no idea what that yellow arrow is pointing to, but I meant something with that other arrow. And now check this out. Um, this both Sony and Canon have webcam utilities, which actually kind of make things simple. And notice what Canon would be recommending, and this is their screenshot, is yes, you still have the dummy battery, but you can take your USB cable and go from the camera directly into your laptop, no separate device needed, and you just download their software, which is free. Other brands may have it, but both Sony and Canon on almost last couple of year models all usually include this. And it actually, whether or not the camera has a clean HDMI output doesn't matter because the utility kind of solves that problem. And this is how you could turn a lot of cameras into webcams called the, called the EOS webcam utility. All right, now we're gonna get to 14 in just a second, but maybe the question we've all been waiting for is what is the best all around camera for YouTube in 2024? I've ordered our top five picks from low to high price. And then I've also made a separate category for pro or full frame cameras and for vlogging, but let's go through our top five. So number one, coming in at $638, that's a pretty average price, is the Sony ZV-1 Mark I, the original version. I, when you think about all of the different things that you need and price, so we're considering the, the 14 things, we've only covered 13 so far, but we, we've, we've considered all the different features and how much is it gonna cost you and what can it do for you? The Sony ZV-1 comes in at around $600 and is uh, an incredible camera. Now next would be the Sony ZV-E10. Right now, uh, this camera, you could get just the body to clarify, no lenses included. So at around $600, you need more than that. You're gonna either need to buy the kit lens, but the reason I actually would probably skip on the kit lens is I want to hand pick the exact lenses I want. And in just a second, I'm gonna be sharing with you one of our favorite lenses for this camera. It's the ultimate YouTube setup. But in a 2024 world, this is this is a, this is the one. This is probably uh, if, if I'm thinking about price, all the different factors. I'm I'm, I'm going to go Sony ZV E10. Um, if I want to vlog with it, talking head YouTube videos, connect it to you know use it for live streaming. Really great camera. Now, third on the list, also coming in for just the body at six hundred dollars here in the U.S. Of course, you can look up you know local local international prices. Is the Canon R50. If I had to choose between Sony and Canon, I'm going Sony. We're going to talk about why in just a second. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, one of the uh, team members here at Think Media, Nolan Molt, who's filmmaker, cinematographer, knows the features. I was just talking to him about how his wife, Madeline, this is the camera she wants. Why? Simplicity. Uh, Canon's colors are known to look really great. Um, there's no easier to use camera. There's no better form factor, really, the way it feels in your hands than Canon. And so there's some pros and cons, which we'll cover, but I definitely think the Canon R50, which Canon's goal themselves was to make this the new M50, which is a classic camera. That's still great. Some people are still using it. You can definitely go with older models. I just want to give you the most current information and this one would be third on the list of our top five, ordered by price. Next up would be the Sony A6700. We've jumped all the way to $1,400 here in the US. This is gonna be for the body only, so you're gonna need to accessorize. Um, but this camera has been is incredible. And with how trendy AI is, they've legitimately added uh, a chip inside of the camera that helps with um, autofocus tracking. It's pretty shocking, all the performance. And there's different things that they've included where you don't need the dummy battery. You go USB cable into USB-C into the camera, right into the USB-C of your laptop that can handle it. And it's gonna power the camera and give you your data. So if you just bring your laptop, bring a simple tripod, bring your A6700, and you're in a hotel room, you wanna create content, you start thinking through, oh wow, these setups can get, I don't I don't need to lug around extra cables and all this different stuff. Many reasons why this camera is great and I'm gonna recommend some uh, resources in a second here. And then next would be the Sony FX30. I'll put my money where my mouth is in my um, Las Vegas Think Media office, which is just the home office, but it's cool to be in a couple locations. Um, I just personally, 
considering all things, what I needed mainly to build a setup like this. If I was starting from scratch in 2014, 2024, um, I would get a Sony FX 30. I just purchased one. We already had another one at think media. I'm using two cameras, um, not three in that setup. I'm using like this camera and that camera. You don't need to, but that's, that's what I personally, and I just picked up an FX 30 considering the price point, you know, $1,600 again, that's body only. The reason I did it is because there's an internal fan and I just wanted no chance of the cameras overheating or there being issues. Now, this is an A6400, I think. So is this. I think uh, this is a Sony ZV-E10. The only reasons I was doing A6400 here is because at Think Media over the years, um, by the way, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. It's an amazing camera. Um, but I picked up this one because the Sony ZV-E10 is, you know, again, one of our faves. I've probably already thrown so many model numbers at you. It's kind of stressful. But here's the point. I've never had any issues with these cameras overheating. But when something is mission critical, you could tell I do this professionally. I'm like, this is my career. I need this thing to just, no matter what, never fail. I'm going to get the one with the fan inside of it. So that was my thinking and kind of, there's other reasons too, but like that, that was the, the big game changer. So let me recap these five best cameras for YouTube. You've got the ZV. If it's a point shoot camera, not interchangeable lenses. I could argue that's an advantage because for 638, Yes, you need maybe a few other accessories depending on what you want to do with it, but you're good to go out of the box, ready to start creating content. And then stepping into just bodies only, the ZV-E10, don't be tricked by $600 because now we also need to get a lens and lens is, but that's also an advantage if you want more flexibility and ultimately a better shot. Then we go R50, A6700, and the Sony FX30. This would be the top five debated by Kyle, Nolan, Omar, all at Think Media that we would put in our list for the average all around YouTube creator. Your tip, you know, for what we need specifically as content creators that are maybe not making specialty content, but just the average content considering price, value, all the different things we've been talking about. And when this video is over, Definitely watch our brand new and updated best camera for YouTube 2024 video. So you can see examples of footage. You can see the reasoning and the logic behind some of these top picks. Omar did an incredible job. This video will be linked up in the show notes as well as the end card at the end of this video. So definitely watch that. But now let's talk about briefly cameras for vlogging. That's a specialty Situation, I would argue, I don't really vlog. I do most of mostly educational content in this environment and talking head videos or video podcasts. But if you would say, no, I mean, that's that's my content format. Like I am going to be on the go. I'm going with my family. I'm going individually. I'm going to be traveling. The Canon V10 is interesting at 349. The Sony ZV-1F, if I had to choose between the two, that is an, a camera is meant for vlogging. These both of these cameras are all in one, but the lens focal length cannot change. You cannot zoom in at all. You just have one continuous shot. And uh, as far as focal length goes, the Sony definitely has an advan advantages in terms of crispiness of shot over the V10, but both are very cool. Omar, who's part of the Think Media team, loves the V10. Now you could step up to the GoPro Hero 12 Black Creator Edition, which is accessorized for $500 with the light, with a little microphone, with the media mod case, with a little selfie tripod thing. That would be on the list for vlogging. The DJI Osmo Pocket 3, which is really kind of making waves in the creator industry right now. And people are loving that one. And here's one of the marketing points. It has a one inch sensor, like, oh my goodness. And it's, and, and it's got a gimbal built in. Pros and cons to everything, but that's one to consider if you're looking at vlogging. And then the Sony ZV-1 Mark II, one of the main, most significant changes they made was it's a wider lens. Truth be told, the weakness of the Sony ZV-1 is the built-in lens, which you can't really change, although we'll link it up. We have a video of how you can hack it with a little lens modification effect. This, this guy right here is makes a wide angle lens for your ZV-1 and it's, I think, like $30. But all that to say is um, if you were like, man, vlogging is 
the exact purpose. And like maybe the only purpose I need for this, then you may want to look at the Sony ZV-1 Mark II. However, $900 is, you know, you get what you pay for and definitely check out all of these cameras listed out for the best price in the description down below. Those are our affiliate links. Now, remember, our last category before we cover number 14, and then before we cover some money-saving tips and um, a bunch of other cool stuff as we land the plane on this video, is what if, though, you want to go pro? What if you want to go next level? You want your, you know, I want the best of the best. I want to go pro. I want a totally distinct look in terms of my content, or I've got aspirations for filmmaking, more cinematography. What are the best pro ca cameras and full frame cameras? Here's the list. The Panasonic S52 definitely is part of the conversation. And it's pretty wild at $2,000 what they've packed inside of that camera. The Sony ZV-E1 is a full frame Sony that we have covered here on the channel. The Sony Alpha 7 IV is on the list. And then you have the Sony 7, 7S 3 uh, A7S 3 is actually what it is, and the Sony FX3. Now, in Las Vegas, we have a studio where we film our podcast. For us, we have three, or we're about to get another one, of the Sony FX3s. That's kind of bougie because it's a four thousand dollar camera, but that is a uh, it's it's Sony's cinema line, kind of the best of the best, and similar to the FX thirty, which is a crop sensor camera. It's like a full frame version, and it's it's unreal. And then, but now you're getting into do you want to build ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars in your setup? Because you're also not going to really want to buy cameras like this and not also buy great lenses, uh, but. These would be on our list through all the debate. I'm curious if you're a little fancier in the gear you're pursuing, would you change any of the cameras on this list? Would you switch them up? Here's a quote from Nolan Molt. He said that the Sony a7S III and the FX3 are basically the same camera, but the FX3 is better because of the fan and because it's sort of intended for filmmaking. But personally, he would purchase either one, depending on which one was on sale or more affordable. And that's number four and number five on the list. Another point to bring up here is, do you need the camera to be dedicated just to video? Or do you also want it to be great for photography? So it not only has multi-purpose use, but also because you're gonna use that one camera for shooting awesome thumbnails, awesome photography. There's a term called hybrid cameras. If you wanted the all-in-one, the Sony a7 IV is probably the one I would go for where you get video and photography and everything's gonna look great. Whereas the Sony FX3, while you can snap some photos on it, that's not the intent. And while the Sony a7S III is also a hybrid camera, it's not um, the way they adjust the way they set up how many megapixels the camera has makes it better for video but weaker for photo depending on which way they're leaning the intent and end use of the camera we've shared a lot you might be a little bit overwhelmed but just check out the links in the description and then and trust us we've done our research but we got to hit number 14 this is probably one of the most important parts of the conversation and if you have been getting value, it would mean the world to me if you smash the like button and even share this video maybe with somebody that is researching cameras. Number 14, does this camera have a future-proof ecosystem? And probably one of the most important questions is, are the lenses I want available for this camera? Accessories comes into the question as well. And, and even saying, where's this brand going next? What else is this brand going to be adding? And so one of the reasons why, especially with debating with Kyle and Omar, why Sony, because people will say, why are you? Oh, by the way, this video is not sponsored and nobody is paying us. Uh, no brand is paying us. We've worked with a lot of different brands. But just so you can know transparently, we, we're trying to give you the most unbiased, just like information. And there's no compensation from any brand. We have been paid from Canon before. I think Sony, I don't think they've ever paid us. They've given us lender units and I think uh, gear to review un, in an unbiased way. Um, but we're, we just want to look at, okay, what is the information? What do we feel? 
The reason we go Sony and and really love like the ZV-E10 is because of the future-proof ecosystem. That's the one of the main arguments. So if you could get the Sony ZV-E10 for $600 just for the body, our favorite lens is the Sigma 16 1.4. If you want the look, I can't even demonstrate it to you because the lowest this lens goes is 2.8 and 2.8 here and 2.8 here. Usually you're not going to go lower than 2.8 unless you get a prime lens. And these are all zooms, which allows me to you know switch the shots up here in the office. But what's my point? You can't even get a 16 millimeter 1.4 lens for like the Canon R50. Now you could get a converter and get uh, an older Canon lens EF and mount it on there, but okay, fine. But like that's that's going to be its own thing. And so if you look at this article, it said the Canon EOS R50 is compact and capable, but it's lacking for lenses. Now that just means right now, and Future Proof Ecosystem says, well, where are they going next? What's going to be happening? You know, as the Canon RF line evolves, but we don't know. I'll tell you right now, Sony's stacked. <laughs> like, and, and you also have third parties that believe in the ecosystem. We're talking about a Sigma lens. There's amazing Sigma lenses, Tamron lenses, Rokinon, all including autofocus, so many different options for Sony. Not only that, ecosystem-wise, they've set it up in such a way that if you start APS-C sensor, eventually buy a more expensive full-frame body, you can flip into crop, mo crop mode on that camera Literally, it's like they thought through the whole thing. They thought through people's progression with their camera line. I know my hurt feelings are trigger some people, but we're just trying to think through all of the different important factors. So when you look at the R50, at this exact moment, there's not really third-party options except for some really weird niche manual focus lenses. So if you wanted to get the look with lot, really blurry background or some diverse you know, lens options, best you can really do for the Canon R50 is the 16 millimeter 2.8. Listen, that's not bad. It's like, it's, it's still gonna be an amazing setup. It's, it look beautiful. In fact, probably no one's gonna care, but what is your goal? What is your desire? And I mean, if you're gonna spend in your money anyways, you want to invest in gear that's going to serve you not just for the next year, but you you use this camera for years to come. This A6400 is probably four or five years, you know, whenever this came out, and it's still helping me create content right now. So how future-proof is the ecosystem? This little kit on screen here, by the way, oh, I'd be all, this is still amazing. Like, I, I in fact, I'm pumped about this setup. This camera is amazing. These lenses are going to look great. Even the price points on screen, I, you could get the kit lens with your R50 if you invest in that. But yeah, pick up the 50 millimeter 1.8 and the 16 millimeter 2.8. These are some great prices. You're going to have a great look, but you don't have that those very low aperture options, at least at this moment. And then there's a huge mistake people make, and that is not budgeting for accessories. Rather than just thinking about getting the most expensive camera body, not even just how much do you want to spend on lenses, but eventually... Do you want to mount the camera on your desk and get that desk mount as well as the cables you need and the dummy battery, as well as the lenses, as well as computer video editing software? What is your vision? What is it you want to build when it comes to content creation? Think about your holistic budget, not just your total budget for camera and lenses. And a few ways to actually save money is, well, this is our 2024 updated list. Of course, it's okay to purchase older camera models. You can buy refurbished. Canon has a one-year warranty. A lot of times on their refurbished or all the time, it's a limited warranty on their refurbished models. And don't overspend on the features you don't need. Again, if you're like, I need to make sure I have IBIS. Uh, I, I want to get the A6700 because it's got some cool features. Well, if you're going to end up just putting the camera on a desk and plugging it in and keeping things pretty simple, then you could get a lot more bang for your buck on lighting. You know, eventually you're gonna need lighting to also set up a shot like this. And you can think about, okay, let me just get a good enough or a great Sony ZV-E10, five, $600 for this body. Let me throw on the, a, a lens that's gonna give me what I want. I wanted a zoom lens so I could set up a shot like this. But then I also wanna make sure that I could get some lights and 
what are the other things that I particularly need for my setup? And if you go to older models, I looked up completed listings on eBay and I found a Canon M50, like not the R50, the M50 with the kit lens, four batteries and the original box sold for $297, $20 shipping. And that was, you know, in the last month at the time of recording this video. And so don't ever feel, feel, um, you know, pressure. Like you have to have the latest and greatest. Um, if funds are limited, there's a way to get some cool stuff. And as everybody wants the latest and greatest stuff, like there's, you could shop around and there's risks that come with this as well. Like you're probably not going to be backed by a warranty. How hammered is this been different things to consider. So I think that there's a whole, I just want to give you all the information so you can make an informed decision. Personally, if I could stretch, I'm going to stretch a little bit more into, uh, like already the R50 from Canon is available refurbished on Canon's website. Um, so how important is having a warranty to you? So here it is for, uh, or actually the M50 Mark II for 350 with a year long warranty is available on Canon's website. It's actually not available. It's out of stock, but you could, you could click the notify me when it's available and get an older model with a warranty as opposed to taking the risk. I've done it a lot, but Craigslist, you know, eBay, especially on the come up, you know, like you're, you're hustling. But I, I do think that when you're investing this much money in tech, it is nice to, to consider, do I have a warranty? Is it going to ease of use for returns and exchanges? That's why, you know, Amazon is, uh, we, we love and recommend a lot of gear as you look in our description and we'll be we point a lot of the cameras to Amazon because if you pick up one of the cameras, you know, shipping it back to them, it's usually going to be pretty stress free. If something was to happen, um, you, you could, you know, add additional care packages or different things. So all kind of things to consider. And here's a money saving tip. Obviously, this video is about choosing a dedicated camera for YouTube. But an option is instead of buying a camera, you could use your phone and invest in accessories. On screen, you see a little tabletop tripod. In this case, a microphone intended for an iPhone that plugs right into the lightning port a little ring light that clips on top. And we'll link to some videos in the description if you want to accessorize your smartphone. And so here's the question for you. What do you think is the best camera for YouTube? And do you disagree or agree with any of my top picks? What camera do you want to upgrade? And what features are important to you? These 14 features, the different cameras we recommended. Hopefully this has been a helpful video and definitely check out the video on um, the best cameras for 2024 where Omar will show you the footage. He'll show you test shots. So you can really make an informed decision with some of the best cameras. Click or tap the screen to check that out. My name is Sean Cannell, Rhymes with YouTube channel. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Smash like if you got value and I will see you in the next one.